Good evening. We meant to devote this programme entirely to the eclipse of the sun, but something else very interesting has happened. A comet or asteroid or something has hit Jupiter and left obvious traces. With me, Pete Lawrence, Chris Lentholt. Pete, you've actually photographed this. I have, Patrick. I mean, this is a, an incredible feature on um, in Jupiter's atmosphere. It was first discovered by Anthony Wesley in Australia, on, uh, who imaged it on the 19th of July. And after his announcement that there was this, this dark um, scar, if you like, in Jupiter's atmosphere, lots and lots of other amateurs have followed on from that and taken images of it. And about the size of the Earth? About the size of the Earth, and it's spreading as well. It seems to have uh, elongated mm -hmm. in, in size. But um, yes, this is something which has, has hit the planet and left this dark um, scar on the planet's gaseous um, atmosphere. We've got a, a rather lovely drawing here as well by Paul Abel, which shows it very clearly as this dark feature um, towards the Southern Pole again. The amateurs have done a great job in discovering and monitoring this, but the professionals have been paying attention as well. So the first image I saw was from the Keck telescope on Hawaii in the infrared. You can see the, the, the spot there. Um, and then later on with Gemini, again in the infrared, and with this wonderful image from Hubble, uh, which shows a lot of structure in the spot that you can't see from the ground. This image is also special because it's the first one we've seen from the new Hubble camera that was installed just a few few months ago. Looking at this, it just has to remind us all, Patrick, of the Schumacher Levy impact back in 1994. Mm. I remember it indeed. It was there quite clearly. It came round from the far side of the disk, bearing in mind that Jupiter spins around very quickly, it was brought into view, and the producer dark streak that lasted for some time. Now, whether this will do the same, I don't know. But the Schumacher Levy, that was due to a, a comet that hit Jupiter, and we were actually able to, to watch that comet come in and break up as it entered Jupiter's intense gravitational field. So we had a, a little string of comets, so we could predict when each one was going to hit. But of course, what was different about that one and this one is that we didn't see anything coming. So and also, we've got a single impact. There's no sign, is there, of anything any else. So up, whatever no. it was, obviously, went into Jupiter's atmosphere, either intact or nearly mm. so. Asteroid, perhaps? We know one comet broke up. Maybe an asteroid or a rocky body would have gone in as a whole. It's very difficult to say what caused the impact. Well, our next program is going to be devoted entirely to Jupiter. It'll be very interesting to see what has happened then. Yes, indeed. Well, at the present moment, Jupiter's nicely in view. Saturn is not the other side of the planet. Saturn is too near the sun in our sky. But the Cassini probe is going around Saturn sending back amazing pictures and amazing data. And Chris has been gathering the latest information. Cassini's journey started back in 1997, since when it's travelled more than a billion kilometres. I haven't come quite that far. I'm here in Bloomsbury in central London to meet the scientists who are exploring Saturn, its rings and its moons. Cassini took nearly seven years to reach Saturn. Its first task was to drop off the Huygens probe, which made the first landing on Titan, the largest moon. That was just the beginning, and since then its main focus has been on providing the most detailed images yet of Saturn and of its family of satellites. The most memorable images, though, have been of the planet's most famous feature, its rings. Although they appear solid, these rings are made up of countless icy particles, ranging in size from boulders all the way down to sand grains, each leading a complicated dance around the planet. Well, thanks for joining us, Jeff. It's an interesting time on Saturn right now, isn't it? Yes, very exciting. Right now, the Saturn is approaching its equinox, which is the time when the day and the night are equal length. And uh, because Cassini is in orbit around the planet, we can watch what actually happens. And what happens is the sun now, the rays of the sun are hitting the ring plane with a very grazing angle. So that exaggerates the vertical structure enormously. So just like we can see the best details on the moon on the dividing line between night and day, it's the same thing. That's right. Just like in a, in a small telescope, you can see certain structure in Saturn's rings. You know? So the first things you see are the, the big gaps in the rings. There is the major gap that people can usually see. It's called the Cassini division, and it separates the A ring, which is on the outside, from the B ring, which is on the inside. 
And the moonlets and structure we've been looking at recently are actually in the A-ring, sort of towards the outer part of the A-ring. And the structure, whenever I see it, is incredibly subtle. You have all these fine features. Did you expect that sort of uh, detail before you got there? Structure throughout the rings, uh, people ask how many ringlets there are. You know, that's, they're not separated, but there is structure all through the rings. This is actually discovered by Voyager, the Voyager spacecraft over 25 years ago. Uh, we don't know what most of that structure is caused by. We know what some of that structure is. Some of the structure is caused in spiral waves, tightly wrapped like a watch spring. They're actually spiral waves, and they're caused by the different moons. And these spiral waves are very closely related to the waves that we see in spiral galaxies. So how do the moons influence the rings? You see these tiny little moonlets, you call them, in the gaps. How do they affect the particles around them? The spiral density waves are actually caused by moons that are outside the rings. We also have moons buried within the rings, but they also have very weak gravitational influence on the surrounding ring material. Now, because the rings are in innumerable small particles, in centimeters and meters in size, they behave like a fluid. This fluid has pressure and viscosity and self-gravity. So these moonlets that are in the rings, their gravity causes disturbances in the flow, so to speak, of these ring particles, which transfers momentum. So it actually clears a gap in the ring by virtue of its own gravity. Now we know two places in the A-ring where this happens. One's called the Yankee Gap, and has a moonlet called Pan. It's about 300 kilometers wide. And the other's called the Keeler Gap, and it has a moonlet called Daphnis, and it's only about 30 kilometers wide. And Daphnis was discovered by Cassini, is that right? That's right. The moon Daphnis, while it's, it's causing uh, this horizontal variation in the ring particles, that moon is actually inclined with respect to Saturn's equator. So it goes up and down by several miles compared to the mean ring plane. And as it's doing this, it's causing the ring material to go up and down as well. So what you end up with is a like a corrugated flat layer that's maybe only tens of meters thick, but it's corrugated and it waves by as much as a kilometer. One set of interesting features that have just reappeared in the images are, are the spokes. What on earth are they? Spokes were actually discovered by Voyager 25 years ago. They're these shadowy, flickering uh, structures that appear in the rings. By the way they scatter light, we know they're composed of tiny, tiny dust grains. But what actually triggers the formation of these things remains unknown. There's two ideas. One is that they're triggered by impacts of meteoroids in the rings, very violent, 50 kilometers a second impacts, like an explosion, TNT. And another uh, hypothesis is that there's energy channeled upwards from lightning storms and thunderstorms in the planet's atmosphere. So now that the spokes have come back, they're actually appearing again. Cassini can explore the second theory that can correlate the lightning storms with the spokes. So if they appear when there are storms, there's they're likely to be some sort of um, causality there. That's right, and if not, then maybe it's the other explanation. But the reason why they were not apparent when Cassini first got there, probably, again, it has to do with the seasonal effect. The sun's angle was more steep at that time, and the sun kicks up electrons off the ring plane, which charges these grains and just sucks them back down into the ring. So it's like the whole area was cleaned out by this field. Now that the sun angle is very low, that stopped, and we're starting to see the spokes again. Cassini's images have fed the unique fascination many have with the planet's rings, but they have also revolutionised our view of Saturn's moons. Recent attention has focused on the most active and most unusual of them, the tiny, icy world of Enceladus. One of the most remarkable discoveries by Cassini in 2005 was that this small moon is surprisingly active. There are uh, jets of water ice grains and vapor expelled into space forming magnificent plumes you can you can see in this nice backlight pictures you probably know but you've been doing something rather special your instrument actually collects particles that started off on Enceladus that's right uh, the most some of the particles leave the gravitational influence of Enceladus the moon lays a track of ice grains and by this means is forming the so-called e-ring and so what are these particles made of well, as you would expect, uh, they are predominantly made of water ice. But in many of these grains, we found that they are salty water ice. And this is uh, what, give, what, what led us to the conclusion that the uh, 
that the plumes and the jets must be fed by a salt liquid, uh, liquid reservoir of salt water. Why do you need this liquid reservoir on Enceladus? You're, you're talking about a source of liquid water, not just ice melting. To get salt into the water, you have to bring it in contact with rock. And there's supposedly quite a large rocky core. If you bring liquid water in enduring contact with such rocky material, you get the salts uh, extracted from the rock and dissolved in water. That's the same process at, at Earth. The Earth's oceans are salty because they extracted the salt from the, from the rock. When you say salt, what exactly do you mean? Well, the, the most abundant component is table salt, like you have in, in Earth's oceans, just sodium chloride. The second most abundant is uh, sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. Well, they sound like familiar ingredients. Yeah, there's familiar ingredients. It's, it's the, the rock is probably not that different from, from Earth's rocks. And there are smaller amounts of, of other salty components. Why is it exciting to know there's liquid water there? Well, of course, liquid water is of particular astrobiological interest because it's one of the prerequisites for, for the formation of life. Our finding really makes a strong case for liquid water. There's obviously much more to be discovered at Enceladus. And Cassini, in the meantime, will continue to provide us with a deeper insight into the many mysteries of Saturn, its rings, and its moons. Well, Cassini had been a great success and had a long way to go yet. And now at last, for the total eclipse of the sun. Sadly, I couldn't get to see it, but um, both Chris and Pete did, and they had varying fortunes. Um, Chris, um, how did you get on? Well, we travelled to a site just a hundred kilometres off the coast of China, not far out from Shanghai, on a ship to try and see this eclipse. The, the track, uh, the, the portion of the Earth where you could see a total eclipse, started in the early morning over in India, crossed over into China, went down across several major cities, including Shanghai, headed out, touched some Japanese islands and finished off in the Pacific over by Iwo Jima. Um, and to be honest, there was nowhere along the track that was predicted to have very good weather. So we thought being on a ship so we could move around uh, was the solution. And we tried to do that on Eclipse Day. Things looked reasonable to begin with. I mean, there's cloud around. This was the first glimpse we had of the moon passing in front of the sun, an early partial eclipse seen through cloud. You can actually see from this image why this eclipse was special. Uh, you can see there the relative proportions of the moon's disk and the sun's disk, and the moon looks much bigger than normal. In fact, this eclipse occurred when the sun was almost at its furthest from us, and the moon was particularly close. So the moon is bigger than normal in the sky, the sun's smaller, that makes this a long eclipse. In fact, the, at, the, at its best point, the eclipse was well over six minutes long. It's actually the longest any eclipse will be until well into the 22nd century. So we saw the partial phase, we got another glimpse of it a bit later, there it is, grinning down at us through two claps in the cloud, and it's about, oh, what, 70% eclipse there. Like a face. Yes, yeah, we thought, we thought the sun was smiling at us. <laughs> um, and after that, things got increasingly desperate. It started raining, uh, we tried a little eclipse worshipping, sun worshipping, anything we could think of to try and make the clouds part. Uh, and despite steaming all over the East China Sea, we just couldn't find that crucial gap in the clouds, and that was the last we saw of the sun that morning, I'm afraid to say. Bad luck. Pete, you were blessed with better fortune. I was, Patrick, indeed. I, I was about 900 metres up in altitude at a site around the Shanhangping Reservoir, and there was a, a great big perimeter track around the reservoir with about 6,000 other people there, and we were blessed with thinning cloud. The sun was actually completely obscured at the beginning of the morning, about an hour or so before the eclipse, but then the clouds thinned and thinned and thinned, and we got first contact. There's the very edge of the moon oh, starting yes. to creep in. A huge sigh of relief when you can <laughs> see that from all the <laughs> eclipse experts, knowing that all the predictions are right as well. But then we saw the moon gradually creep across the sun's disk. We had a bit of very varying thickness cloud, and a few um, moments were covered up. Then. At the crucial moment, the moon has crawled across the sun's disk completely, and then the last vestiges of sunlight are visible as a tiny, thin arc. And you can just make out in this image some little dots of light. Those are Bailey's beads. This uh, is the sun shining through uh, valleys on the lunar surface. That's it? right. With the, the rugged lunar surface, you can just see these, these intense points of light there. A few moments later, uh, we, we went into we totality. That's where the, the moon is covering the sun completely. And, um, of course, when that happens, you've lost the bright 
um, disc of the sun, the, the bit which is known as the photosphere, the visible disc, if you like. And what you can see is just the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona. Now that's the thing which, which sort of separates a total eclipse from a partial eclipse. And then, of course, as the moon gradually slips down, yes. so you start to get the, the rugged edge of the moon hitting the edge yes, of the sun, indeed. and then you get this bright um, bead that appears, the single bead. It was very intense. But uh, then that's when the, the illumination goes up and the eclipse is over. Well, there's another one next year. Sadly, my travelling days are over. Are you going to go? Well, it's mostly in the Pacific. It does cross Easter Island, but I think we're still looking for the right two-man canoe to take <laughs> us down there. Um, coming up, of course, I think the next one that's of interest from the UK is 2015, oh, when yes. the track crosses the Faroes. Mm. And that will mean for most of the UK we'll have a pretty large partial. They will, yeah. So I think that's the next easy one for us. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Patrick. From the Sun to the Moon, LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Now going round and round the moon, 30 miles above the surface, and sending back excellent pictures. And for the first time, they've shown artefacts left on the moon. The one stages of the Apollo launches and various experimental practices. Here, for example, is Apollo 11. You can see it quite clearly. There it is, with its shadow. And then Apollo 14 in the Far Muro area. And here we can see the tracks the astronauts moved around and also the actual craft itself. And finally, Apollo 17 in the Taurus Littrow Basin, totally different terrain. And again, we can see the spacecraft quite clearly. While I've been talking about the moon, Pete has been out of the garden, getting ready to tell us about a very remarkable variable star. A star which shows variation in its brightness over time is known as a variable star. Now, the reason for this variation can be down to a number of things. It could be down to, for example, something inside the star changing the output of it. Alternatively, it could be down to an external influence. For example, if there's another star in orbit around it, which is dimmer, if that star passes between the main star and us, we see the whole system dim in brightness. Now, such a system is known as an eclipsing binary. And there is a very interesting eclipsing binary in the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. Now, you can find Auriga quite easily um, throughout the month of August by going out at about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and looking in the northeast. At a height of about 30 to 40 degrees, there is a fairly bright yellowish star, which is known as Capella, and that's the brightest star in the constellation of Auriga itself. If you look below Capella, there is a fainter isosceles triangle of stars, which are known as the Kids. Now, the top star in the isosceles triangle is Epsilon Auriga, otherwise known as Olmaz. And this is the eclipsing binary, which I want to draw your attention to. Now, you can see the variation in the brightness of Olmaz over time by comparing it to the star at the base of this isosceles triangle, which is known as Eta Aurigae. The eclipse is due to start in August, and it's a very special time to start watching it because this isn't a very frequent event. The eclipse actually occurs every 27.12 years, which is a very long time. The eclipse starts at the beginning of August, and it takes about six months or so for the star to reach its minimum brightness. It then stays at that level for about a year, and then climbs again, taking again about six months to maximum brightness. And then it's another 25 years or so before another eclipse starts. The eclipse is about to start in August, so get outside and watch this amazing event unfold. Well, Pete, still in the garden, thank you very much. Next month, we're going to talk entirely about events on Jupiter. So until then, good night. Mm -hmm.